Hathaway kids. We are going to learn a new song today called I Walk by Faith. And you might be wondering where the kids are. They're having too much fun playing outside. So you're just stuck with me today, but I promise you they will be back next week when we add some actions into this song. So your parents might recognize this song. Uh, it's a bit of a throwback to the 90s, and they may have sung it when they were kids growing up in church. And you'll notice the word faith is repeated in the song a lot because that's what you've been focusing on in your lessons with Ruth Ann. So first, I just want you to echo back after me. So I'll sing the first bit and you sing it back. I walk by faith. Your turn. I walk by faith. My turn. Each step by faith. Your turn. Each step my turn to live by faith your turn to live by faith my turn i put my trust in you your turn i put my trust in you and you might have been thinking whoa that last part sounded really cool so it kind of pulls a little bit from the blue scale there on the word trust you kind of get to do this kind of bendy sound with your voice I put my trust in you. Can you try that? I put my trust in you. So I think that's the coolest part of the song. Uh, you may or may not agree. Uh, but let's try singing it again. And I'm going to sing a slightly longer phrase this time. And then I'll have you echo it back. I walk by faith each step by faith. Your turn. So you can see there's not a lot of words. Let's see if we can sing that all together now. So singing along with me. You ready? Here we go. walking by faith, walking by faith. So even when we can't see and there are some unknown things, walking by faith and knowing that God is in control. And next week, we're going to add some actions to the song. So maybe this week you can even come up with some ideas of some actions you might want to show for walking by faith. See you guys. Good morning. I hope you had a good week as always. I'm really excited about an activity we're going to do together today, even though I can't be there with you to do it. But first, our memory verse. Did you memorize it? I hope so, because it's for points. Alright, ready? For we, by, and not by, 2 Corinthians. Did you get it? Good job. Okay, so we've been talking about faith and how we have faith because of what God says to us in the Bible, because we know He loves us. And last week we also talked about how faith is like trust. So to illustrate this idea, your parents are going to help you with a little activity. We're going to need some volunteers, someone who doesn't mind being blindfolded. Alright, I'm going to give you a few moments to pick your volunteers and get blindfolded. Okay, so no cheating. If you can see, make sure that you let someone know. 
Okay, once you're blindfolded, you're gonna be led around the room. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and let that start now. And while that's happening, I'm gonna let everyone else know what's going on. <clears throat> so, the children are being led around the room right now. They're being led around things like ottomans, or kitchen island, or dining room table, something they've seen in the room. And while they're being led around the room, this is gonna happen. So when they get back to this spot, they're going to be asked to Okay, I'm going to give you a few more moments. Okay, I hope everyone has sat down and you can remove your blindfold. So was that scary? Were you nervous? Maybe not. So that activity is like when God asks us to do something It's a little scary or we're unsure about. But just like your parents who are leading you around the room, God loves you and he's only gonna ask you to do something that's good for you. He's only gonna ask you to do what's best for you. So when you were asked to sit down, you had to trust that you weren't gonna fall over and hurt yourself. So let me give you an example. Many years ago, um, when I was in university, I wanted to go on summer missions. So summer missions is a group of people who get together and they go, typically they go and help other people, but at the same time they're telling them about Jesus. And there were all these options of places I could go, and most of them were warm and tropical and exotic, but there was also Winnipeg. And I knew deep down, even though I wanted to go to all these lovely exotic places, that God wanted me to go so when I was filling out all the little forms, I checked that Winnipeg was the only place that I would go. And I thought, if I'm supposed to go, I'll go, and if not, then I won't. But I got chosen. And the day that I stepped off the plane in Winnipeg was the day I met Mr. Leo. So you can imagine, I'm very happy that I listened to God and I trusted Him. And I had faith that what He wanted was what's best for me. So. If you hear God asking you to do something, I promise you it's what's best for you, just like with your parents. And just like with your parents, he's going to be right there with you. All right. I hope you had fun. I will see you next week. Bye. Great things he has done And great our rejoicing Through Jesus the Son But purer and higher and greater will be The awe and the wonder when Jesus we see To God be the glory Great things he has done Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, lift up His great name and tell everyone, to God be the glory, great things He has done.
let me tell you, oh my friends, about this joy I'm living in. Let me take the mic, go on a test if Good morning, Padley family. Welcome to our online worship service. I hope that you're enjoying the beautiful long weekend and the extra time off with your family. Good morning. Good morning, Pathway Church. Please join us this morning as we sing and declare the promises of God. Darkness tries to roll over my bones For when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know and I won't be shaken I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your
chance when I'm standing your love Oh, there's power that can break off every chain There's power that can empty out a grave There's resurrection power that can save Power in your name, power in your name. And my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. And my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. And my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your Morning, Pathway Church. So good to see you again. We're so glad that you have joined us this morning for our Sunday morning stream. If you are a guest or a visitor with us this morning, we'd love to hear from you. Just put a shout out in the comments, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook. Maybe shoot an email our way at admin at pathwaychurch.ca. Uh, we'd love to hear from you if you're a visitor joining us for the first time this morning. I have a couple of announcements for you this morning, then I'll pray for you, and then we'll get back into our worship time. My first announcement is to remind you that after this service, for half an hour, we have a hangout opportunity via Zoom. As the service kind of draws near to the end here, we're going to put a link in the comments section of both YouTube and Facebook of a Zoom call that you can join and you can hang out with your church family a little bit after the service. Pastors will also be there for any prayer needs that come up, but we just want to see you again, and we figured this is a good way of getting it done. So again, as the service draws near to the close here, we're going to put in a couple links for a Zoom call that we'd love to see you join. This year, Betty's Run for ALS is going online. It'll be a virtual run this year, and Pathway Church is hoping to participate as we have since 2008. Runners and walkers are both welcome to participate for free in the team Jesse's Girls. So the point is you go for your daily run or your daily walk. Maybe you're going to train up and make sure you can do this run as fast as you can. And then on the day of, we're all going to run at the same time. Not in the same location, but throughout the city in different spots. Wherever your favorite spot is to run. Maybe a spot like this. But make sure that you register for the team Jesse's Girls on the website for Betty's Run for ALS. What you need to know, run or walk on Sunday, June 21st at 9 a.m. Wear your Jesse's Girl t-shirt or some sort of bright green t-shirt. Fundraise on the team site, again, that's Jesse's Girls on the Betty's Run for ALS website. Take a picture of your race on June 21st and send that to admin at pathwaychurch.ca. It'd be wonderful to put together a little collage of our church's involvement with this important virtual run. Join with me now in a time of prayer. Dear God, you are so good to us. Thank you that spring has sprung and we get to enjoy some of this lovely sunshine this weekend. Uh, we pray that you help us to be active not only in our day-to-day -day lives physically, but also help us to be active in prayer, active in reading your word, active in spending time with you and with our families. You are not supposed to be our lowest priority God. If that is the case for any one of us, I pray that you forgive us for that sin. And instead, through your Holy Spirit, Father, we ask that you motivate us to recognize that you are our priority in life. 
Thank you for loving us and being kind to us. Thank you that we can still have church in the midst of this. And dear Lord, with that in mind, help us each to be the hands and feet of you during this difficult time. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Now over to Christina and the team for some more worship. Sing my way out of the valley I'm gonna shout my way up to the mountain I will take hold of the truth of your promise I'm gonna praise, I'm gonna praise I'm gonna push through till every light crumbs I'm gonna dance in the midst of the rain I'm gonna rest in the arms of the Father. I'm gonna praise, I'm gonna praise your name. Dance in the midst of the rain 
I'm gonna rest in the arms of the fire. I'm gonna praise. Oh, I'm gonna praise. And I'm gonna sing my way out of the valley. I'm gonna shout my way up to the mountain. I will take hold of the truth of your promise. I'm gonna praise. I'm gonna praise. And I'm gonna push through till every light crumbles. I'm gonna dance in the midst of the rain. And I'm gonna rest in the arms of the Father. I'm gonna praise. I'm gonna praise. So good morning. I'm anticipating that Sunday, uh, this Sunday of the Victoria weekend is supposed to be just beautiful. I'm sure you're out in your gardens or outdoors and enjoying the beautiful weather. Uh, some of you may have heard uh, that uh, the government, uh, Alberta government, has released new guidelines for worship services, for religious services. And you may be wondering if at Pathway Church at Cambrian, we will be opening up with these new guidelines. And so let me just very quickly explain that uh, it is our feeling at this point in time uh, that it's not wise uh, to open up again. And let me tell you why. Uh, the guidelines uh, do not make a real connection with people and worship uh, viable. Uh, so the, basically the guidelines are you must be uh, less than 50 or you must be less than one third of your congregation. For us that means about 50 people. So we would probably have to have three worship services but that's not the only restriction. One of the biggest restrictions is children are not allowed uh, in special programs. So no nursery, no children's church. Uh, children have to be with their families and stay with their families. That means they can't even visit together and the six foot rule still applies. So in the auditorium where we to worship, we would have to also maintain the six foot rule. Uh, the other thing is singing is so important to us in worship and it's one of the things that's prohibited. And so you're not allowed to sing. Uh, you have to maintain social distancing at all times. You're not allowed to have any food or food preparation. Uh, that includes drinks and uh, coffee and so on. And then there's a whole bunch of sanit sanitation rules that you need to follow. You need to disinfect bathrooms periodically, People need to wash their hands. They need to have, there needs to be these alcohol uh, stations where you can disinfect your hands. When we looked at all of these things and then the risk uh, that we could be entertaining, especially for those uh, seniors who are vulnerable. Uh, we just believe at this point in time, we need to continue our online services, and uh, that has served us well. It's not ideal, but it's better actually than getting together with all of these rules. And so we'll let you know as time goes on, if the government relaxes some of those rules, we feel safe uh, in having services, we will just continue to have, we will then start having services in person. Uh, with whatever the regulations are. But for now, we're going to continue with the online worship. And we encourage you to be part of that, to sing, to pray, to listen to the message, to respond to the message as if you were actually face-to-face -face connected in, in our auditorium, in our fellowship ha uh, hall. Um, one of the things, too, we've added is 
at the end of each service, there's a hangout time. And so I want to encourage you, just come to the hangout time. You'll have a link that will be posted so that you'll know how to access the hang hangout time. And uh, just come hang out with us, uh, talk with people, connect with people. You'll see it is very rewarding to do it. And since we miss being together so much, it's just not ideal again, but it's, it's something that we can do that helps us maintain connections. Uh, so we've been going through uh, the book of Isaiah, or we've been selecting passages in the book of Isaiah. And of course, last week, or two weeks ago, I talked to you from Isaiah chapter 40. And there's a picture of God in that chapter that is just so powerful. I mean, it talks about how the fact, verse 12 in chapter 40, how that God holds the waters in the hollow of his hand. And so God can take all of the oceans, the immensity of the oceans, and put it in the hollow of his hand. He can mark off the heavens. In other words, measure the heavens. He can, he can basically, God is so big that it's nothing for him to take out his tape measure and measure the whole universe. Light years and light years of travel would, would, would be necessary to travel the universe, but for God, he just measures it by just stretching out his arms. Uh, and so he is omnipresent. He is ever present. He is everywhere at the same time. Uh, in verse 13 and 14 of chapter 40, we got the idea that, that God is all-knowing. He's omniscient. Who directs God? It asks the question. Who's his counselor? There, and of course, the answer is no one. Uh, who, who does he consult with? Well, he doesn't have to consult with anyone. He knows everything. Uh, who informs him? Nobody. And so God knows everything. God is aware of everything. So he's omniscient, all-knowing. And then verse 15, it talks about his power. That the, the nations are like a drop in the bucket. All of the power, you take all of the power of the great nations in the world, all the armies of the great nations of the world, and you put them all together and they're a drop in God's bucket. That's how big and powerful God is. Uh, it says that uh, there's, they're like a, a speck on the scales. And so when you're weighing things to, to understand what's the significance of all of the power in the world, what is the significance of God Compared to God, the significance is like a, a speck of dust. And so he is omnipotent. In fact, if you add up all the power of all the nations, the Bible says in verse 15 of chapter 40 in Isaiah that they are nothing before him. He is, in verse 28, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. And so we talked about how we wait on God. And when we wait on God, then God himself strengthens us. He, he helps us to mount up with wings like evil. He helps us to walk and he helps us to run and not get weary. Uh, and so this picture of God, in a sense, is one of the transcendent God the all-powerful God, the God who can do anything, knows everything, can be everywhere, the big, powerful, transcendent God. In chapter 41 of Isaiah, we're going to look at some verses that actually paint a picture of the eminent God, the God who is with us, the God who is in us, the God who is with us in our everyday life. So, not only is he transcendent, he is with us, he is eminent. And so we're starting in chapter 41 at verse 8. And so this first section is about who you are in relationship to God. We're going to get who God is in relationship to us, but who are you in relationship to God? And so for verse 8, it says, but you, Israel. So Israel is symbol of God's people. And so as a Christian, as someone who's invited Jesus Christ to come and take over, 
Someone who at a point in time said, I need you to do for me what I cannot do for myself. I need a savior. I need a deliverer. I need a rescuer. When you invite him to come into your life, you become a child of God. You become part of the people of God. You become a special, significant person to God. And so what does he say? But you, Israel, you're my servant. So right off the bat, you need to know this. You will live proportionately to how much you serve. Jesus said it this way. He said, if you want to be great, you need to be the servant of the most. You look at Jesus' life and you see in him a servant. He washes his disciples' feet. He is constantly serving. And at the act of the cross, the suffering and the passion of Jesus Christ is, is him laying down his life voluntarily to serve us, to be the payment for our sin, for our mess up, for our, our screw ups, and to die on the cross for those what we call sins. And so you are his servant. You live by serving God. Your passion in life is to serve God. And so not only are you servant, he says, Jacob, whom I have chosen. You're chosen by God. Uh, you need to be able to hear God say, I chose you. Jerry, I chose you. Larry, I chose you. Bob, I chose you. Rob, I chose you. You need to be hearing what God says. You need to hear God call you out. That's who you are. You are chosen by God. And not only are you chosen, he says, descendant of Abraham, my friend. So you're, you're a descendant of Abraham. You're his friend, just like Abraham is your friend. In John chapter 15, Jesus says, I don't, I don't call you slaves anymore because I'm going to show you what I'm doing all around you. I'm going to show what's going on. I'm going to let you in on my activity. In fact, I call you friends. So Jesus, because he lives in our lives, and he, of course, is God's friend. He's God himself. He actually makes it possible for us to have friendship with God. And so you're a servant. You're a friend. You're a chosen one. In fact, the very last part of verse 9 says, And said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not rejected you. Now, I want you to hear this because this is God speaking. Sometimes in the Bible, we talk about God. Sometimes in the Bible, we tell stories about what God did. But here, it's actually God talking to you and to me. In other words, it's like God is standing or sitting across from you and saying, let me tell you how I feel about you. Let me tell you who you really are. Let me tell you what your identity is. You are my servant. That's how you, lie. you are alive when you serve. You are my friend. You are my chosen one. You are never, ever rejected. You will always be uh, mine and chosen by me. And so that, that's your identity. If we keep on going in this passage and we look a little bit further in the passage at verse 10, uh, he begins to talk about who he is and who really he is in your life. And again, this is God speaking personally to us. How do we know that? Well, from the pronouns. So in verse 10, he says, do not fear for I am with you. I am with you. Notice how many eyes we have here. Do not, uh, do not anxiously look about you for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Verse 13, I 
for I am the Lord your God who upholds you, uh, your righteous hand, and who says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Do not fear, you worm, Jacob, you men of Israel, I will help you, declares the Lord, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. And so notice the prevalence of the word I, the first pronoun, singular. So God is saying, I am personally involved in your life. I am involved. So out of all the people in the world, I'm involved with you. And so I can have a relationship with you. You are not some corporate entity. You are a person that Jesus Christ that the Holy Spirit, that God the Father is personally involved in. And the evidence of that is that word I. But it's not just I. If you look closely here, uh, it says, do not fear for I am with you. I am. Oh, do not anxiously look about you for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous uh, right hand. And verse 13, for I am the Lord your God. And verse 14, don't fear, I will help you. And so I want you to notice here, because whenever the word I and M are joined together, and you're talking about God, then what, what you're talking about here is the name of God. God himself says that his name is I am. And so you remember that when Moses went into, uh, went up the mountain, and God encountered him, that Moses asked God, who his name was, so that he could tell the people of Israel, the people who were in captivity in Egypt, who is this God and what's his name? And God says, I am that I am. And from that, we get the name of God, which is Yahweh, or some people say it's Jehovah. And we need to realize what is he saying there? He's actually saying to Moses, I am whatever you need. It's like a blank check. I, I signed the blank check. Whatever you need, you just fill it in because I can be that in you. Um, it's really like Psalm 23 um, where it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Whatever I need is in that relationship with God who is my shepherd and so if you continue to think about this, you realize that in Exodus chapter 3, where Moses meets God, um, God is talking with Moses, and Moses is asking him questions, and he's saying, hey, how am I going to release the people from the power and the control of the Pharaoh? Who am I to do that? And God's answer to Moses is basically, very simply, I'll be with you. In verse 12 in chapter 3, he says, certainly I will be with you. What's no noticeable is that when Joshua is about to lead the people into the promised land, and I'm sure he feels just as inadequate in that role as Moses did when he was on that mountain and was commission to go let the, get the Pharaoh to release the people, uh, it's kind of amazing what it says here. He says in verse 5 of chapter 1 of Joshua, it says, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Then he says, just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you, and I will not fail you or forsake you. Uh, in verse 9, he says, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not tremble or be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So in the most 
fundamental sense, you and I are completely different because God is with us. And that comes to us through grace. And so not because we're great, not because we're perfect, not because we're better than anyone else, but God actually wants to be with us. And so when you're looking at this passage and you realize that the I am God is your God, verse 10, and he will help you. I want you to think about that because being a helper is really important here. In fact, this is what he says. He says in the second part of chapter 10, I will strengthen you and surely I will help you. He says, I will uphold you with my righteous hand, my righteous right hand. And then in verse 13, he says, I'm the Lord your God who upholds you with your right hand, who upholds your right hand, who says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Do not fear, you worm, Jacob, you men of Israel, I will help you, declares the Lord. So three times he actually says, I will help you. So realize that I will is the to be verb, just like I am. It's just in the future. He's basically saying, not only I am whatever you need, I will be whatever you need. And I want you to know I am your helper. In John chapter 14, Jesus is talking, and he's talking about the Father who's going to send another helper. And so here, here he says this, I will ask the Father. Uh, verse 16 uh, in chapter 14 of John, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That's, that's pretty cool, isn't it? So I'm gonna get, I'm gonna go and ask the Father to give you another helper. And Jesus even says, I've got to go away. I've got to be crucified. I've got to be resurrected. I've got to go away so that we can send the helper. And of course, the helper is the Holy Spirit. That is the spirit of truth, verse 17, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. And I will not leave you or orphans. I will come to you. This is Jesus' way of living inside us. Um, verse 19, and after a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you live also. And in that day, you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. So what is he trying to say? He's trying to say, you're never going to be alone. You're always going to be with God because the Holy Spirit's going to be with you forever. And what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit helps. The Holy Spirit helps. So in Isaiah, he says three different times, I'm going to help you. I'm going to be your helper. Uh, I will help you. I am the helper. And so he's saying Yahweh helper. God in his essential nature is a helper for Christians, for his children to, to walk with him, to, to endure life, to live life, to go through difficulties. It's the foundation of the Christian life. Do you want to know how God lives inside you? He helps you. In the most fundamental sense, when you cry for help from God, he lives inside you. How do you, in a sense, take who God has made you as a Christian, a new creature, a new person, with a new relationship? How do you actualize that relationship in life? You actually ask for help. You let God be your helper. You let God help you. When do you 
let God help. Well, you let God help in all kinds of different times when you are inadequate. So when you feel inadequate, that's the invitation to respond to God, to let him help you. Uh, whenever I'm trying to fix things or do things, I feel inadequate. Honestly, in the house or something like that, I phone JP. He's my helper. He's more than a helper. He actually does it. I just got to hand him tools because I feel inadequate, but I have a helper who is willing to come and be a part of all that's going on in my life and, and help me, especially with those things uh, in regards to fixing things and, and house things and all of that. Uh, when you lack what it takes, then you need a helper. When you're weak, then you need a helper to make you strong, to strengthen you. God promises to be able to strengthen you when you need direction, when you need guidance, when you need wisdom, when you need to make decisions. You need a helper. And so in all of these times and whenever you in yourself don't have what it takes and you need a helper, God says, I want to be your helper, and that's the way I live inside you. Well, there's something in these verses that we need to pay attention to because it's very important. So in verse 10, it says, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look around you, for I am your God. Now notice that, fear and anxiety attached to the need for a helper. So when do we need a helper? We need a helper whenever we start to experience fear and anxiety. So fear and anxiety are really key. Verse 13, I am the Lord your God who upholds your right hand, who says to you, notice, do not fear, I will help you. And then in verse 14, he repeats it again, do not fear. You worm, Jacob. That, that means even in the fact that you could be afraid because alone you should be afraid. But with me, you don't have to be afraid. I will help you. I will be your helper, declares the Lord. So what is this about? Well, fear and anxiety are the springboard to trust. When you experience fear, that initial fear, that initial anxiety, that is God saying to you, you need my help. What do we need help for? Whatever makes us fearful. What do we need help for? Whatever causes us to have anxiety and worry. So when you experience the initial fear, that initial anxiety, that's the test. That's the trial. That's the opportunity to either turn that into trust in God and let him be your helper or continue in a constant or chronic fear or anxiety. It's fear and anxiety are the smoke alarms in our lives with God. So the smoke alarm goes when it senses smoke. Well, these fear and anxieties that we experience in life are the smoke alarm saying, you need God for a helper. You're not going to make it on your own. You're not, going to, you're not going to be able to make it without God. You're living your life without God. Stop doing that. When, of course, when you hear a smoke alarm, the first thing you do is what? Well, you open doors, but the second thing you do is you stop the smoke from happening. I mean, you, if it's a toaster, you turn the toaster off, you pop out the toasts, whatever you need to do. If it's burning on the stove, you pull it off the stove. God is saying, whenever you experience fear and anxiety, it means you need me and you need me as your helper and I am whatever you need. Jesus said it this way, I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of life. I'm life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am every single thing that you need. And so when you need a helper, call on God right away. Transform the fear and anxiety into trust and let the trust be your way of letting God live inside your life. I need God always. 
I need God in my life when I'm inadequate, when I need direction every single time. You say, well, you don't know what I face in my life. You don't know the challenges. There's, listen, listen to what he says here about the people who are against uh, Isaiah or the people of God. And this is what, when God is connected to you and he is your helper, this is what happens to your enemies. This is what happens to those forces that oppose the work of God in your life. Uh, in verse 11, he says, Behold, all those who are angered at you will be ashamed and dishonored, and those who contend with you will be as nothing and perish. And you will seek those who quarrel with you, but you won't find them. He's saying the forces that oppose you, all of a sudden, they're gone. Because God is your helper. Because God is your God. Because he is your Lord. Because he is walking with you. Because you are his servant. Because he's chosen you. All of those reasons are the clear reasons why God can chase away your fear and anxiety. And he can annihilate whatever opposes in your life, the work of God, he transforms you. In verse 15, he's got a basically a, an illustration here. He, he's, he's talking about you and I being transformed. He says, behold, I will make you a new sharp threshing sledge with double edges. Now, we don't know what that is, but very simply, he, a threshing machine, if you've ever seen old threshing machines they used to use, uh, it basically takes the grain just the way it is at the beginning of the threshing process. And at the end, all you're left with is the grain itself. So you, you start out with straw and grain and chaff and all the other stuff, and you end up with pure grain. Uh, today we use combines. Uh, combines do exactly the same thing. Now this is what God says about you. When you're coupled when you're yoked up with him. This is what happens. He gives you a brand new sharp threshing sledge with double edges. It's the best combine you could ever have. And what do you combine? You are so powerful when you're teamed up with God that you actually thresh the mountains and you pulverize them, he says. And will make the hills like chaff. It's like you're feeding into that combine that the uh, mountain. So can you imagine something harder to thresh than mountains? There would be nothing. It, it's absolutely crazy to even think about doing that. But God says, that's the kind of power that you have. You will winnow them and the wind will carry them away. And then finally, he just says, and you will rejoice in the Lord and you will glory in the Holy One of Israel. So what's the end product of God in your life as your helper? Joy. What's the end product of you serving God? Joy. What's the end product of walking with God and letting him strengthen you? Meet your inadequacies. Be your helper. The end product is you're so amazed at who God is. You glory in who he is. You're in awe of who he is. That relationship intensifies. The relationship grows. God actually works in you that you are more and more impressed with who he is in your life and in other people's lives. So you have joy and you glory in God because that's what we were meant to do. Now, there may be some of you watching this service this message, and you don't know how to get there. Let me tell you how you do it. You asked, you ask Jesus Christ to take over in your life. You ask Jesus Christ to rescue you from life without God. 
you ask Jesus Christ to come into you, invite him into your life as your rescuer, your savior, as your master, the person that you turn your life over, as the one who runs your life from this point on. When you do that, then God can be your helper. The Holy Spirit lives within you forever. The Holy Spirit reworks everything and your enemies melt away. Those forces against God's work in your life, they melt away. You become this efficient uh, threshing, mountain threshing combine that God can use to take away the impediments for life and the barriers in life. It all depends on that one invitation of Jesus Christ into your life. That's the good news. Invite him into your life and forever he becomes your helper through the Holy Spirit who lives in you. And those of you who've already done that, you may be living life as a practical atheist. What's a practical atheist? It's just someone who believes in God, but it doesn't impact their life. How does God impact your life? Well, he impacts your life by being your helper. So let God help you. Stop living it on your own. Let God be the I am, the Yahweh God. I am everything you need. I am yours. I will be with you forever. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you so much for who you are in our lives. We turn our lives over to you. We ask you to rescue us daily. We are inadequate, but you are our helper. We need direction, but you are our helper. We need guidance, you are our helper. We are weak, you make us strong, you are our helper. In everything in life, you are our constant helper, our God, our God. We serve you. We've been chosen by you. We love you. We have the joy that comes with walking with you and asking for your help. And we glory in you. We are so impressed with who you are. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.
thank you so much for joining us, Pathway. We love you, and we'll see you next week.